Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Drury. Drury Blank. I work with the uh, chair of an NGO called the Rights Realization Center. I'm the non academic that's been invited to this event. But in contrast to what Simon said at the very beginning on this occasion, we have a 50% uh, a Canadian uh, panel. So um, <laughs> watch out. Um, we're going to talk about protests following on from the states we were going to examine the implications and what part protests play in desectarianization we want to look at whether uh and how the integrality the integrality of this bottom-up driver for desectarianization can occur where it occurs how it occurs i think we're also going to touch on the limits of protests also some risks and, and what that entails. The order of speakers will be um, on my right, Dr. Hadil Abdul Hamid, is a fellow of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, um, and a non resident uh, fellow at Lancaster University. I think she will talk about gender politics within the context of the protest movement in Iraq, which took place uh, in 2019, and also women's participation in the electoral process. Keeping with Iraq, Ruba Ali Al Hassani, uh, who you heard from earlier, is a postdoctoral research associate at Lancaster. Uh, we'll talk about desectarianization in the context of those protest uh, the, the protests, and has talked about using the inter integrating the critical race theory into desectarianization. Finally, mostly on Lebanon, I think, um, Anna Christine Brun. Uh, from Aarhus University, who, um, who's finished the PhD thesis, we'll, uh, we'll talk about um, the data, right, the, the Lebanese 2019 October uprising. Um, and we'll perhaps turn our, turn our thoughts to uh, solutions as we go on. So five to seven minutes, six to seven minutes each, um, starting with you. Um, so, um, Ali, um, I'm going to talk about uh, this report that I have recently published with the uh, Conrad uh, Adrenaline Institute that I focused on the views of uh, women activists who took part in Tishreen, uh, the protest movement that took place in 2019 in, in Iraq. And why I find this really important, because in security and IR studies, women mundane activities are excluded from this mainstream. And I can see throughout the literature of feminist security and feminist IR um, scholarship, uh, the struggle to prove the importance or to bring the importance of women a contribution to uh, post-conflict uh, project, peace building projects, um, as if it is something not related to the context of, of uh, post conflict countries such as Iraq. So um, I was thinking of what, what to write about Tishri. There are so many um, uh, topics, ideas um, you can uh, approach Tishri. And again, even with women, I've noticed that uh, there is a really um, um, good literature now is building up uh, that uh, categorizes gender as a balance of analysis to social movement and mobilization in Iraq and Lebanon, also in North Africa, like Morocco, Tunisia. Um, but I was like, um, how about to say, how can we fit the Iraqi gender politics within the, um, the discourse and the narrative? of uh, elections and electoral process. How can we fit with Iraqi women's struggle to be uh, included within this um, uh, masculine uh, uh, discourse? So the, the, uh, uh, the report um, was based on uh, 43 interviews with uh, key Iraqi women activists and heads of NGOs and CSOs. Um, and it tried to shed to find the connection between what did the contribution of those women, how did this contribution participated in shaping women's decision to be part of the electoral process? Would they like to contribute to the elections? What type of contributions 
if they are boycotters, is this going to influence the result of the elections or the right elections? Having said that, um, the idea that uh, early elections um, was one of the demands of the Shin people. Uh, so, uh, to talk about women's contribution in the Shin is really hard to break in. But I don't want, because it's, it's really easy to enumerate the oppressive mechanism practiced by the patriarchal state and also by male activists. We can talk about this maybe tomorrow. But it's, it's really important to highlight what did they, they, what did they do uh, to create a counter narrative, a counter discourse of this oppression. Um, so I'm sorry, because it's, it's I'm trying just to focus on the main points and maybe just, uh, and then after that, we'll jump on the recommendations that the report suggests. But in specific um, provinces, because the, the report uh, focuses on Baghdad as the capital and the Qar and the Basra, uh, two sovereign provinces that witnessed um, really um, were, were the places where uh, oppressive. Uh, uh, tactics uh, targeting uh, women rather than men to silence them, definitely intimidate them, and to check to uh, uh, aim it to, to uh, make them change their mind to be part of this political uh, 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 change or demand. Oops, sorry, trying to fix this, but yeah, it doesn't. Um, it's really important to make sure that women activists. Uh, were part of uh, two main streams in the uh, in Tishrin. Some of them were reformist. They were asking that this this government is all right if we can suggest some reforming um, uh, suggestions, like in the constitution or uh, the, uh, the the state uh, craft itself. Others were rejecting the whole political class. They were in no way. It's been the case since 2003, nearly 20 years, and same faces, same um, uh, approaches. Um, what uh, is really interesting about women's contribution in Tishreen is that it made them make decisions whether should we contribute to the elections or not. And uh, coming from the uh, square protest where they witnessed how um, of this young generation, men and women, were really helpless and hopeless that they would go bare, armless, in facing heavily armed security forces. So what they did is, as many of, of the women that I interviewed, that they refused the idea that we are supporting male activists. We are activists. We are not here as auxiliaries for male activists, and specifically women in Basra, uh, where they experienced a series of, of assassinations, nearly five between 2018 and 2020, of key female uh, activists were assassinated. More than 20 plus of female activists were forcibly displaced, and some of them disappeared. No one knows about where they are. And despite the, the fact that this definitely limited uh, uh, their participation in the elections. They had a different role, is that they started to be, to encourage other people, to encourage other women to be part of the electoral process. The majority of, of female activists that I um, uh, interviewed, uh, they do believe that democracy would come through balloting. That's the only way that they believe in, despite the whole foggy vision uh, that uh, accompany the uh, uh, electoral uh, process, which, which is so far until now actually really, really disappointing and made so many of them um, questioning the, um, uh, the, the the political system and the electoral process itself. So, yeah. Another just to go through the recommendations that we were talking about a political education, which is highly recommended by the majority of those women activists that there should be political education among women activists because it's not only to take to the street 
entered to demand political to ask for political demands but also what do we need what would be the next step how can we ap uh, apply this how what are our tools and and, and techniques to uh, reach this democratic uh, state sorry for that yeah thank you <laughs> you've got a slides uh yes they're just for visual support <laughs> I was short in the earlier panel, but I cannot promise I'll be as short this time. I'll try my <laughs> best. Um, so I'll start with a quote on the next slide uh, by Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa Al-Khadmi, where he said, Often there will be people who blame the current government for the failures of previous governments. Mismanagement, under the guise of uh, representation. In Iraq, talk about as nothing but a lie. In reality, there's a party based under the guise of representation. The state is the responsibility of all state institutions, the executive, legislative, and presidential bodies, and even civil society. It is an integrative relationship that includes all. Blaming this government is both unfair and duplicitous. And those were his words at a recent press conference a few weeks ago. And there's so much to unpack from this one quote on its own, uh, beginning where he plays the role of the victim when he actually emerged from a political elite as a former spy chief. Uh, so he can't play the role of emerging from this political you know, establishment as well as playing the victim, especially as a spy chief. Um, and then there's the other component where he denies the existence of sectarianism or Taifi in Iraq, when everyone knows that it does uh, on one level or another. And then I want to emphasize the part where he talks about the existence of a party-based consultational uh, system that functions under the guise of representation, yet he denies the pervasiveness of sectarianism in Iraq. So how can you acknowledge a system that politicizes identity without acknowledging the discriminating policies and practices that emerge from politicizing identity? And uh, as we all have discussed, that sectarianization is a process. It emerges from social, political, and other forms of conditioning. And desectarianization emerges from a similar process. And when you politicize an identity, you end up policing it, managing it, and possibly erasing it at some times. So this quote of his can be unpacked, and I can go on forever. This is why I gave the warning about you know, how long I could go. But um, his government in particular has been using, we can move on to the other slides. Uh, so his uh, government, you can fast forward to two others. Um, so his uh, government has been using data defamation laws um, to silence dissent. Um, and especially from protesters, activists, and um, he claims that civil society shares the responsibility in state building while spending much of his speech, you know, painting himself as a victim and using his, uh, you know, premiership to uh, silence uh, dissidents while claiming to be on their side. So this is political and sectarian gaslighting um, at its finest. And he attempts to obfuscate the existence of an ethno-sectarian uh, based uh, state power structure, which is designed to alienate civil society from state institutions. And in the same press conference, he addresses a recent scandal from the Ministry of Education where examinations were leaked before the actual exams took place, which uh, compromises the integrity of the Ministry of Education. And as uh, an education expert on TV said, what do we have left other than education? And it's really the most important thing in any society. And it used to be the finest in Iraq decades ago, and it has deteriorated so much. Um, so when I listened to the press conference, I couldn't help but connect the two because Mustafa Al-Khadami downplayed the education problem, the scandal. And he said, oh, we placed a few arrests and that's it. But it's a much deeper problem and we cannot divorce the connection between um, the education system and critical thought and sectarianism and society. Um, and I've done workshop and uh, interviewed academics in Iraq, educators, uh, about 
sectarianism and desectarianization. We can forward a slide or two. Um, you can just, you know, like every minute you can just forward. It's just a visual um, aid. But uh, <clears throat> so in the interviews with educators and academics, <clears throat> sorry, they all um, say that uh, in order to push for desectarianization in Iraqi society, we need to lean on the social sciences. Um, they argue that we need uh, that identity in society in Iraq uh, needs to be reconstructed, especially national identity. And when they say that, they their rhetoric is very similar to the literature on sectarianization, desectarianization, that identity is a social construct and you can deconstruct it and reconstruct it over time through dialogue and through many other measures. And so when they say that and argue that uh, the social sciences and the humanities are the most important way to challenge uh, sectarianization, the sectarianization process. I couldn't help but notice that um, everything they said about constructing and deconstructing identities is very well aligned, not only with the desectarianization discourse, but with critical race theory. In the sense that um, many Iraqis are cognizant of pervasive sectarianism, while others may be denying it um, and treating it as ordinary and non aberrational and, and being blind to it, sort of like colorblindness when it comes to race and other countries. And while foreign meddling has indeed contributed largely to the sectarianization of Iraqi and other societies, locals cannot deny their agency in the process. So one of my interviewees kept on asking the question, how do we own up to our role in this process? Uh, we have all played an active role and we need to own up to it. And other, uh, other interviewees asked how minoritized people fit into this conversation because the conversation, uh, sectarianization discourse focuses a lot on Sunnis uh, and Shia and it's very cliche, it's very dated. We need to update it and look at other uh, people who are marginalized in this process. And uh, critical race theory, uh, and shares a common point of departure with um, desectarianization discourse. Uh, they share a deep skepticism and criticism of the mainstream primordialist position in their perspective fields. And the primordialist perspective shapes and assesses people's socially constructed identities, differences, and any arising conflict between them by always elevating an identity-based group over another and reducing identities to invariable traits. Uh, they also depart from a mainstream perspective in their fields that denies the active role of systems of prejudice and shaping social and political dynamics on the basis of identity. Uh, they also, so the race-based uh, race -based identity and sect-based identity are different and they emerge from different systems and different historical contexts, but there are, the, there are similarities in the sense that they are parts of one's identity that they cannot deny. Um, and they cannot even pass as someone else. Uh, by inviting people to confront their prejudices as members of social structures perpetuating ident identity-based discrimination, critical race theory encourages us to engage in intersectionality and anti-essentialism. So there are pockets of Iraqi society, for example, that do not fit into one identity. So there are Faili Kurds or Shia Kurds, there are Sunni Turkmen, there are Yazidi women, for example. And if we embrace a new fr framework um, and incorporate it into our dis desectarianization discourse, it might help us find these nuances and engage with them more deeply. Um, and it will help us deal with the color blindness or the sect blindness that Mustafa Kavani dealt with in his speech. Sorry, one second. But please think about black and white. Yes. And so um, when we propose critical race theory and the education system, we encourage students to um, destabilize hegemonic discourses that are pushed onto them in and outside the classroom. And um, it also helps researchers and people in policy to check their own positionality and their own prejudices when approaching the sectarianization discourse in Iraq and any other context. Um, it, it forces us to look at the systems that you know, brought us where we are here today and not just individual contexts and uh, issues which are all interconnected. 
and and to engage in critical race theory is the perfect way to counter the dangerous crackdown against civil society and free speech in Iraq. Um, we can introduce it, not necessarily only through syllabus, but through going to the internet and through what Sana was saying earlier, you know, going to door to door, engaging grassroots mobilization and proposing a critical framework, which is not actually, you know, included in the current discourse. Social sciences in Iraq are very stagnant based on classical theories rather than contemporary theories. So when we inject this kind of, you know, uh, framework into how people perceive the sectarianization discourse, we can try to push things into a more constructive direction. That's right. More into kind of a, almost like a curriculum uh, uh, panel rather than about uh, protest. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll to you. Thanks. Uh, and thanks to SATNET and the Foreign Policy Center for arranging this conference. I'm happy to be here in person uh, for the first time in a very long time. Um, I'm in Christina Bun, for those of you who don't know me. Um, that's not a very easy name to pronounce for non Danes. Um, I'm based in Denmark at August University, and I've been part of the SATNET project for the past, I think, three and a half years, um, which has been a pleasure. Uh, my presentation today will focus on the Lebanese October uprising, which is also the focus of my PhD research. Um, so the uprising, for those of you who don't know it, uh, broke out in 2019, and it drew an estimated million people to the street, which is quite a number of people for a country as small as Lebanon. Um, it, it was triggered by proposed tax on WhatsApp, actually, but it also reacted to deteriorating uh, economic and social conditions in Lebanon, and very importantly, it included explicit calls against political sectarianism. So for instance, protesters used chants where they directly accused politicians of manipulating sectarian divides to stay in power. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why the uprising has contributed to increase the interest uh, in protests as bottom-up drivers uh, for desectarianization, both in Lebanon, but, but certainly also uh, abroad um, in other divided societies. So my presentation will reflect on what can be learned from the uprising, what can the uprising tell us about the potential and limitations of these popular uprisings um, against sectarianism. Um, so in the past three years since the protest broke out in Lebanon, the country has gone through a very hard period, to say the least. Um, an explosion has destroyed big parts of Beirut, an economic and political crisis has thrown large parts of the population into poverty, um, thousands have left the country uh, over the past years uh, simply because they couldn't find any opportunities uh, in Lebanon anymore. Uh, at the same time, there's been limited political change. So the same leaders more or less remain in power. Uh, the system also remains in place um, and has been able largely to withstand uh, pressure from, from below. So therefore, it's not hard to understand why many people believe the uprising was a failure. Um, but as scholars, however, I believe we should turn focus away from this binary discussion uh, of whether or not the uprising was a failure. I think a more productive discussion is how the uprising reflects some of the more general challenges and opportunities of uh, popular mass uh, protest against sectarianism. So this is also what, what I'm going to focus on. Um, and this, this document is based on the premise that single mobilization and even mass protests that take a million people uh, to the streets are unlikely to foster political change overnight of a system as resilient as the Lebanese. So instead, we should turn focus towards what the can, they can change, they can change the system, then we should rather see them as steps in a longer uh, difficult and, and also non-linear process of desectarianization. And one of the outcomes we should look at, I argue, and this is also in line with what Ruba has been, been talking about previously, is how these protest movements can contribute to forge solidarity between citizens that normally do not meet, normally don't interact, normally have prejudices against each other. Um, and this is not just forging about forging solidarity between uh, sects. It's also about forging solidarity ties between classes, between genders, between people from different regions. Uh, so Lebanon 
uh, is we mostly think of, of Lebanon as a country that's uh, split into sectarian groups, but there are also major uh, fault lines that concern geography, that concern class. Uh, so we need to be aware of those as well. So the interesting question here is what can facilitate or how can protest movements facilitate <coughs> these forms of solidarity building and what makes solidarity building <coughs> difficult? Um, and the latter part is, or the latter question is, is the main focus of my PhD, um, where I asked which, which challenges protesters in the October uprising encountered when, when they sought to forge these ties of solidarity between citizens, not just across sect, but also across other salient boundaries, such as class. Um, so in the PhD, I point to three main challenges related to forging these solidarity ties. Um, and I think these challenges can help us understand First of all, which groups are difficult to include and to forge solidarity ties with during these mass protests? Um, and they can also, I think, help us illustrate how solidarity is not just about mobilizing as many people as possible. It also concerns how to shape discourses and interpretations of different groups, of places, of actions, um, of, of, of social relations more generally. So, Briefly summarize the first challenge I put to my PhD is how protest movements can become inclusive of groups that are on the margin of society. So in the PhD, I, I explore um, difficulties related to including a particular segment of the Lebanese population, which is young men from Shiite majority areas in and around Beirut. And I show how organizers in the uprising um, on the one hand, really wanted to battle some of the negative attitudes and stereotypes concerning these groups. So the groups were, were largely labeled as infiltrators, thugs, there was a lot of suspicion concerning these groups, um, sometimes justified, but other times not. Um, however, when, when seeking to come up with new discourses and new strategies that could um, be more accommodating of these groups and their, um, their situation, Organizers in the uprising found themselves caught in a dilemma. On the one hand, they really wanted to promote inclusion of a specific sex based group. On the other hand, they were really afraid that having strategies that explicitly focus on this group would lead to accusations of them being sectarian, having uh, shown favoritism uh, towards these groups. Um, and as some organizers told, look, then the, the Sunnis will come and say, look, we focus too much on this on the Shia groups and you give them too many reservations, how about us? Um, so I think this, this helps understand how inclusion and also the forging of solidarity ties with these groups on the margin of society is really a dilemma for, for protest organizers, a dilemma between inclusivity on the one hand and the maintaining the le legitimacy of the protests on the other hand. So the second challenge um, that I look at in, in my PhD research is um, the shaping of the discourses and the media's role in, in this creation of new discourses and representations of groups that have normally been stigmatized or considered as sort of seen in a negative light. Um, and I think Lebanon's October uprising is, is quite an interesting case uh, of, of the media's role because several mainstream media channels, uh, the so-called independent media, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Lebanon, um, they actually sided with the uprising and contributed at least um, superficially uh, to spread positive stories about the uprising. And, and one such story was about the city of Tripoli, uh, which I guess many of you know, that has been labeled as the Kandahar of Lebanon for many years and associated with terrorism, sectarian violence before the uprising. But during the uprising, it became known as the Bride of the Revolution and was really celebrated for its, its festive demonstrations uh, with music and light and DJ and so on and so forth. So seen from the outside, this, this appears to be a success story where the media really contributes to break a stigma uh, of a certain group in Lebanon um, and, and promote solidarity between Tripolitans and the rest of Lebanon. However, um, when I did interviews with protesters in Tripoli across different social backgrounds, um, I found out that residents in Tripoli actually had very mixed feelings about this media narrative. They believed it was romanticizing the city, that it disregarded all the political activism that took place, 
and, and also downplayed uh, the historical context of, of Tripoli. They were actually not that satisfied with, with the way they were being represented. And I think this is an important reminder to observers and scholars of anti sectarian protests not to be too enthusiastic about positive discourses and representation per se. I think it's, it's important to also look at, look at how groups are being portrayed and whether these groups are being portrayed in a way that resonates with their self image. Um, so I, I look at Tripoli in, in my PhD, but I think this question also is worth asking about the role of women, workers, youth, LGBT plus communities uh, within these protests. Are they being represented by others in a way that they can recognize? And I think this is also key uh, for, for these protest movements who forge solidarity ties. They actually create representations that, that echo um, with, with the self perceptions of, of various groups. Um, the third challenge, I know yeah, I'm running out of time, super, super quick, quick um, is the internal divisions that we see in all protest movements, including anti sectarian protests. These divisions regard which tactics to use, which slogans to use, how to make use of the common protest space. Um, what I found in, your, in, in my study of the October uprising was that. Um, on the outside, I, I was focused on Tripoli. It looked as if protesters had fragmented the, the protest space into different zones. And actually, they did. Uh, so the, the ones who wanted to party, they were in one part of the city. Those who wanted to have political discussions were in another zone. And the third zone was kind of allocated for those who wanted to fight the police and, and do more disruptive acts. So, so that could look as if the protest movement had really been fractured uh, along um these different sort of tactical disagreements but really when i started interviewing protesters what they said was that this sort of division of the protest space also helped them to overcome or at least handle the their internal divisions so by allocating different physical areas to groups that had different tactical preferences they also established sort of a way for them to recognize each other and, and having each of their own sort of platforms um, and I think this, this is important, not just to understand Tripoli, but also to understand that when we see a protest movement from the outside and, and look at what, what appears to be a major fragmentation, we need to also be attentive to the way this fragmentation, this apparent fragmentation has been interpreted by protesters. So I think this, this sheds light on the role of meaning making, <laughs> the role of, of protesters' interpretations of the physical actions and the, the way they organize themselves in the ground. Um, yeah, so I think <laughs> we have a fair amount of time, um, but, but thank you for listening and uh, look forward to sure. spending the last 20 minutes discussing these things. <laughs> sure, very much. Thanks very much, all three of you. That's a lot of, a lot of stuff to, to, to unpack. It's quite different um, in a way, um, I think. In advance of any other, are there any immediate Questions? Oh, there's two in the back. Simon and Sana. Any on? I know you'll send them to me on Facebook. Simon? Sure, thanks. It's like really, really interesting stuff. Um, it's as Ruth like said, different, but interesting. And then I have a question for all three of you. And it tries to tease out that sort of intersectionality of identity relating to belonging how do you create this common sense of belonging amidst all the different currents issues agendas aspirations hopes fears that come together I mean, okay, you just mentioned the party tense and the politics tense right how do you create a collective movement driven by a shared sense of all these different things when you've got people going out losing on one hand and then debating for you the other for example uh, and then from that, how do you, how does the reflection on self as a protest movement, let's say, um, shape engagement with the other? Thanks. That's quite lots. Sorry. So, can, we, can we handle that one first? Unless it's yeah, it's very, it's similar. Very close to that. Uh, it's so close to that. I want okay. to know what happens next, right? Because the protesters, they come together, yeah. they have this moment, and what happens next? Especially that most of the groups that they were discussing, and ADA, Aruba, or Aruba, they were talking about non-religious groups, right? Women, mm -hmm. uh, class, all these kinds of 
So what happens next in your uh, experience of the protests? Before you do, do you want to add something? Well, it's, it's a different question, but I can try it uh, I, I, from a different way, I suppose. So, um, to remember in a deal, um, so the deal you say that women were specifically targeted in specific ways, five women were assassinated in Gaza. If you could look into the, the, the violence of the system and try and ruminate and think about um, the, the, the strategy that develops to do that. I mean, who was doing it and why? Was it ad hoc? Was there something more going on? And a linked question to Ruba, I thought that quote from Mr. Academy was wonderful and in a way it kind of summed up uh, all that was wrong with the ruling elite. That's why it's wonderful, not its content. But, um, and I, I, I ask you to do something similar, but for that one individual, how to so clearly you, you quite rightly referenced uh, Kalamaz's history as uh, the head of the Mahabharat, but also what a lot of other, other people reference is this history as a crusading, allegedly liberal journalist, uh, you know, a, a man who fought against, allegedly fought against the old regime, and then and that circle around him. Who, who, who were name checked and celebrated as campaigning journalists, and who now in common street discussions are, um, are, are pointed to as the kind of crucible of, of supercharged corruption. I just, I suppose, what happened would be my question. Were they always corrupt and, and opportunist, or did the system somehow co opt and break? So, two questions about the agency of the system and its ability. To suppress, co opt, and defend. Could have been different from where we started with Simon. Do you want to take Simon's? Yeah, sure. That's um, right. Actually, before you do, Simon, just a quick, quick. You know, when I was at Amnesty, we managed to get the Kuwait government to sit down and agree to put into the curriculum one hour a week from grades five to about eight, um, inclusive idea. They agreed and they implemented it. And that kind of it's what struck me about your two. The, the antecedents, what are the components of well, how did we, what could have, have been another situation in both those, you know, where gender could have been included, where most of the company could have, I don't know, just then. Yeah, education, political education. It's maybe this is the main out, um, outcome of, and that's partially um, speaks to uh, Sana's question what's next? The idea that there is a gap. That's what the majority of women activists that I talked to, that we realized that we are not adequately uh, educated in terms of politics. Because when we were in, in the protest spaces and we've been contacted by the government of, uh, at that time, Adel Adel uh, they were like, okay, so what is your, what are your demands? Um, um, Okay, we need uh, job opportunities, we need uh, uh, fair uh, and equal uh, social equity in terms of gender and in terms of class, but exactly what do you want? And that's that could be one of the, the main aha moments of, of social movement. I mean, in the Iraq, Tishreel is not different from other um, uh, waves of uh, uh, social mo uh, movement that I do really not like to refer to as Arab Spring. It is not Arab Spring. This is we really, really need to refer to such uh, important key uh, events in, in the region because we are marginalizing other ethnicities and nationalities that have been part of, of this uh, way. So as part of and as, as uh, maybe a continuation of, of this wave of social uh, movements uh, is that what's next? Even when the government is reformed, even when there are different uh, types of elections, but again, it's the same similar, if you are to say similar political system that uh, on the contrary, sometimes it's entrenched the authoritarian uh, governance in, in the region rather than uh, um, offering a different um, a different approach uh, or a different uh, social contract, as you mentioned, between the government or the state and, and society. Uh, so yeah, maybe I just responded to your question, Samat. Uh, that's what's next. Uh, your uh, question, uh, Simon, in terms of um, 
the reflection of the self, how did they get the engagement with the other? And also it's something that uh, uh, Anka uh, mentioned that the solidarity between uh, uh, yeah, this, these divisions, the socially structured divisions between uh, genders, between class, between religions and, and uh, uh, sects. I think uh, we talked about that in the workshop yesterday, that it's a, it's a temporal and, hist and, and um, geographical um, um, moment these social movements as if time and uh, any type of discrimination is suspended. It's an ideal world that is created within these uh, protest spaces where there is gender equity, there is acknowledgement of the other, acceptance of the other. But once this, this moment, and this would be very romanticizing of, of, of this political moment, but that's what happened. And that's the stories that I've heard from female activists who just once they get out from the um, protest squares, they are discriminated, they are harassed, they are referred to as tishriniyat. So wow, this is as if it's a bad or a negative reference to, to women who have been part of, of this movement. Uh, but that's the thing, it's that the, um, you mentioned also the intersectionality between uh, the sense of belonging. And maybe we need to look at uh, Iraq or uh, other uh, countries in the region outside the Western concept of what is a citizenship, who is a citizen, and what is the sense of belonging. I mean, personally, I, I lived in, in uh, uh, under the Saddam Hussein regime, and I still remember it in my primary school how uh, uh, textbooks of history, of geography, uh, uh, disseminates the sense of belonging to Al Ba'ath rather than to Iraq, and I grew up under this idea that Al Ba'ath is the is the right uh, uh, ideology, is the biggest family because Saddam is the head of this family. So the sense of belonging um, is what could be different from the Western concept of belonging, if there is any actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, after 2003, uh, and again, I witnessed this shift of sense of belonging. It, it started to be segmented and fragmented. And it could be definitely based on a muhasasa, but it's not only muhasasa. It is really important to look at Iraq. There is a socio-political uh, uh, power relation that orchestrates life and politics in Iraq. I mean, the tribe that that started to be a very powerful dynamic in controlling Iraqis' lives. And again, it's not there, uh, it's something that predated 2003 when Saddam Hussein uh, uh, had the war with Kuwait. So, uh, sorry, I don't want to go on, but uh, the sense of belonging definitely shifted. It started to be to the tribe or to the sect because that's, that's the source of uh, having food on, on the table. That's the only way that I can guarantee food for me and for my family. Um, I'll, I'll answer quickly. It kind of covers all a range of them. Jim, you've been finished quickly because I want to give a, we have one other question uh, awaiting too, only 10 minutes left. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. Did you want to address those questions? Uh, yes. Um, uh, you earlier said that this panel became more about education than so, uh, more of a syllabus. Well, until, than, until uh, Christine spoke. But, uh, but I think education, subversive education, is protest. You know, educating people who don't have the tools uh, and providing them with those tools to challenge the status quo, that is a form of protest. So they come in hand in hand, and I'm quite the advocate of this. Um, in terms of belonging and the peace movement and how it shapes the engagement with the other, um, maybe my Canadian side is emerging right now because I like the idea of a cultural mosaic. So you're not asking people to melt their identities into one pot, you're actually celebrating the different parts uh, of their identity. So I, I really like the idea of Iraq being um, emerging from the indigenous pluralism. Iraq is pluralistic by way of indigeneity mostly. So there are Mandeans, Kaka'is, uh, Yazidis, Assyrians, Chaldeans. You know, the pluralism comes from those groups. They're not, they should not be minoritized. 
Uh, so in order to <laughs> shape a sense of belonging, maybe tap back into the protest movement and the main hashtag in Reed Watan. We want a homeland, not a country, not the state. We want a homeland, which is where the sense of belonging. So they want to come together as a response to years of attempts to alienate them from each other and from state institutions. Uh, what happens after the protests? Again, subversive education. Um, could introduce critical theories of all forms and then let them decide what they want to work with and what new models they want to mold for themselves. Um, about women in protests, I should add that the assassinations were not just physical, they were character assassinations. That helped first started painting them as indecent, as promiscuous, um, painting them as all sorts of negative labels. And then it escalated into physical um, assassinations and forcible uh, disappearance. And Mustafa al Kadami and his circle, were they always corrupt or what happened? Men, most of the political elite in Iraq claim to have been victims of the Ba'athist regime. And they may have been, you know, some were imprisoned, some were exiled. Um, so they were all products of a society under Saddam Hussein's regime. And we are, we are all products of our own societies, uh, except that power corrupts and their agendas when they returned to Iraq and wanted you know, to form governments based on this ethno-confessional -con so, ethno constitutional system, they tried to um, you know, focus all the power according to the denominations. And that in itself is a form of exploitation. Corruption is rooted in exploitation. Some people, and I don't want to make, name names from the government, have good origins at first, who are jurists. Um, and they fell into the trap of joining the government. And again, I don't want to name names, but I do wonder, I would like to have a conversation with them later and ask why. I did ask one of them why did you join the government, but he didn't have an answer. And I might think it has something to do with getting the protection that they did not have before then, and they have been targeted by armed groups, so maybe. Ali, the main question I will have left to you was what comes next? <clears throat> yeah, what comes next? Um, and then we'll yeah, sure. I think, actually, I would like to start with Samit's question, if that's okay. okay. Uh, and then, then segue over to the next. Um, I think, Simon, what, what your question really points to is to how, how can, how can this, this sense of shared unity in, in, in diversity be created um, in, in a country like Lebanon and, and probably Iraq? And I think two questions are important to ask when, when addressing this. Um, and the first is, how is it possible to strike the right balance between unity on the one hand and diversity on the other hand? So how, how can there be a collective identity that does not overshadow or silence diversity? How can we make sure that groups such as women, ethnic minorities, sexual minorities are not being silenced or sort of made so equal with the middle classes, uh, the more privileged groups that they are specific, specific intersectional repression that they're subject to becomes disregarded. And that's the first question, how to strike the right balance between, between unity on the one hand, diversity on the other hand. And, and I think the second question is what unity out of, of many potential unities that, that, that the protest movement or political movement challenging sectarianism can stress. And I think this, this, this leads to a point that I raise in, in, in an essay that will be um, released as part of the report uh, next week um, so the Lebanese October uprising pointed to nationalism as a potential unity uh, that could bridge uh, individuals across differences. And I think whereas nation nationalism is, is, can arouse feelings of cohesion, of unity, um, it's also dangerous to consider it uh, a solution to, uh, to sectarianism or even the opposite of sectarianism.
as we see, um, and, and as you've also alluded to, um, when, when speaking about uh, Saddam Hussein's regime, uh, nationalism can also be used in a very repressive and an even sectarian way. Um, so, and it can also be an empty container as, as it was to some degree uh, in, in the Lebanese case, everybody agreed that they were Lebanese um, and, and, and were the Lebanese people rising against elites. But there was still limited discussion as to what it means to be Lebanese. People might have had very different visions uh, regarding what, what Lebanese-ness actually meant. Um, and I think this, this segues over to the next question. So what next? Um, I think my whole, the whole point of my, my presentation is really to shed light on the limitations of process movements. I mean, we have a tendency, I think, as scholars and observers to, to romanticize these movements because they, they attract so many people to the streets and they're being seen as historical moments, but, but certainly they have the shortcomings First of all, because they're protest movements, they're super politically delicate. Um, they are vulnerable to accusations and, and counter rhetoric coming from all different directions. Um, they're vulnerable to um, inflation of ideas uh, and to sort of evaporation of, of, of you know, discussions about what, what it means to be Lebanese, uh, for instance. So given all these shortcomings that protest movements have, I think we should not see protest movement as the golden standard of anti-sectarian mobilization. It's one form of anti-sectarian mobilization, but it goes hand in hand with other forms of mobilization that are sometimes overlooked by scholars, such as small local grassroots uh, initiatives that don't really address uh, the consociational system, but challenges sectarianism by making people aware of their everyday livelihood grievances as a first step. So I think we have to, to look more at, at the relationship and the interplay between, between different forms of, of anti-sectarian mobilization and also how smaller mobilizations in the wake of, of big protest movements like the Lebanese can sort of borrow or make use of the legacy of the protests and try and, and make up for some of the shortcomings that, that we've seen in the protests. So we've got one final... I'm happy to leave it because I know we're on the phone, so... You're not going to cheat each other if you would. No, if, if we, we could squeeze one more in. So I wanted to know the extent to which um, the protests were unified in their calls for democracy. And because I'm, I'm assuming not everybody there agreed on what kind of democracy they wanted to see. So were there any, um, any movements or any currents that would have rather see a different type of authoritarianism being introduced um, and in these places, or were they all just you know, uniformly supporting democracy. It's a question to follow on the answer. Okay. Very quickly, please. Very quickly. Um, in the Iraqi context, the protesters were very clear about what they wanted. They wanted changes to the, the electoral law. They wanted to dissolve parliaments. They wanted, you know, to, to uproot the system, basically, but through certain steps. Um, there were some few people who kept on saying we need a presidential system and instead of a parliamentary system. And I think this is where education comes in. You know, they need a better understanding of what a presidential system entails, what a, better, um, what a parliamentary system entails, etc. Um, can... Interesting. Then we'll come back to that. Um, yeah. I think when, 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 when discussing this question, there's one thing we should be aware of, which is the, the low level of political in a country like Lebanon. People might say we want democracy, and what they really mean is that they want to be heard and seen and have their rights recognized. But, but to discuss, do they, do they want a, a liberal form of democracy? Do they, are they actually you know, demanding more authoritarian solutions? They might, they might not have this vocabulary themselves. Uh, so I, I think another question that needs to be addressed is what do people through protests learn about the potential alternative systems they can have? How do they how do they shape their opinions by participating in protests, learning more about political participation, their opinions about what system they want? They might not know it that the discussion about democracy in the, in the context of these protests might be very shallow, simply due to lack of political education. Yeah.
Do you want to? Yeah, maybe on one point that might be very simple is the idea again um, to look at Iraq or any other country and should, shouldn't be excluded from the context, from the bloody history of the politics in Iraq. I mean, it, for example, anyone who's related to the political class during Abdul Karim Qasim was uh, executed. They were uh, the idea that any uh, uh, and that I'm talking about maybe from a personal again point of view that I keep he uh, hearing this from my family members and keep away from politics. Don't think about politics. It's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. You will end up either uh, executed, dragged to the street, uh, or you'll be hated by people. So keep away. Try your your. your so that's that we grew up with the idea of politics is bad. We cannot fix this system. So it's definitely be better be away from from this class, you know? So that's that's another context should be taken into consideration, anthropological and sociological, uh, 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 society, uh, sociological sorry, point of view. Maybe two minutes, I, I'd like to answer your question, but I don't, I know that no, but maybe over lunch, we can okay. discuss this strategy of assassination. Sana, do, do you really want to ask it? No, I think just, you know, <laughs> I think it's just a comment because everybody assumes that it's the best and everything, People should be aware of, should have kind of education or political education, but is it revolutions about expressing the need for something different, even if people don't know it? Because it's very different from political transition or political group. It's about revolting, regardless of the education they have. The second thing I'm really fascinated with the work um, that was mentioned by you know, about women. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very important to shed light on the labeling. Uh, of women, uh, because this is kind of a group that even in any panel, they look at severity. So it's great that uh, this panel, you know, put the different groups together because they are always there, they all look at the groups or they look at severity. And I think labeling women, and I think it's very brave by the groups of us and she shoes and the Iraqi scholar. Um, so yeah, I think I just wanted to highlight that because we work a lot with the women in Palestine mm -hmm. and the labeling. Is the one that forbids women from progressing and having their voice. So thank you both much. And also Anna. That's a very nice way to end on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Shall we have some lunch? Great. Thanks everyone. Thanks very much.